Hello everybody, welcome to the Ramsey Center for Western Civilization. Uh, I'm Simon Haynes uh, and I have with me uh, Dr. Laurel Moffat, who's an independent writer and researcher who lives in Sydney and works, among other things, on Shakespeare, and Dr. Colin Dray, who's a teacher uh, and a scholar at Campion College where he also works on Shakespeare, and both of them have told me that they have a particular interest in the book that we're talking about, the text we're talking about today, which is Shakespeare's The Tempest, his last sole authored play. Uh, and we thought this might be interesting to possibly a slightly larger group because uh, we're aware that The Tempest is a set text for this year's New South Wales HSC. So uh, uh, I won't talk any more at this point, but perhaps just begin by asking Laurel, uh, tell us a little bit about the, 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 the historical context, the theatrical context in which The Tempest was written. Oh, sure. Mm. Thanks. Well, um, as you said, it's the um, last of his solely authored plays, although I'm sure there's some debate about that. Mm. But um, Always. Always. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a handy um, way of thinking about The Tempest, because not only is it his, um, it's believed to be his last solely authored play, it's also, um, it's the one that comes at the end of a career that spans about roughly 20 years, mm. uh, featuring about 34 plays. So. Mm. If you think about that, it's a very prolific mm. career mm. Uh, with, in the theatre as well as poetry. More than one a year. Mm. Right, mm. which mm. is extraordinary to think about. Mm. Um, and whereas we have this idea now about authorship mm. um, where you have to have this idea that just springs from your brain, mm. we have these ideas of um, authorship and plagiarism mm. that were very different at the time. And um, it's the Tempest is like one other play in his um, group of plays, and that is Comedy of Errors, which is believed to be um, one early. of his first. Mm. Yes, if not his first. And those are two plays that are um, that are set in the same place. So it observes um, Aristotle's uh, unities of mm. time, mm. place, and action. In the sense that the play takes exactly the same amount of time as the events in the play. Take. Yes, or it's supposed to be roughly um, no more than twenty-four hours. Mm. Um, and in one location. In, 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 one location. And in this case, it's only three hours, right? It actually all happens in right. three Right, it's yeah. very, very fast. Yeah. Yeah. And but also, which one of the, I'm so sorry, no, no, no. one of the characters explicitly states that, that, yeah. that we only have. Uh, That's right. Prospero says, come on, Ariel, we've, yeah. only, we, we've only got till six o'clock. <laughs> That's right, and then that, at the end, it's like time stands, yeah. as yeah. in it's a six o'clock. Yeah. So we marking time the whole time mm -hmm. in this play. But also, it's one of the, um, the two plays where this, we believe, springs straight from his imagination. Right. And Comedy of Errors is the first, and Tempest is the second and the last. And it really is a play of fancy, mm -hmm. the imagination. Mm -hmm. um, language is very rich in this play, mm -hmm. much like it is in his earlier plays. Mm -hmm. um, but also that idea of the poet and or the or the the um, the writer, you know mm. what they can create mm. on stage. So I love mm. thinking of it as a very late as his last play because it has this order to his career, which we all are looking for order. And also that theme of order and chaos is very much a play mm. in the Tempest as well. So so you're one of those who thinks that that, that Prospero's epilogue is Shakespeare's last word to the world. By your indulgence, set me free. You know, few twenty years of writing these things, I can stop now. But I mean, it it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's a lovely yeah. coda, isn't it, yeah. to a, a very full career. Yeah. It's like he's putting it that out there to tempt us to think that. But as with everything with Shakespeare, there's another way of thinking about it. <laughs> That's what, right. What do, you, what do you think about this? Oh one? no, absolutely. I mean, he he baits that trap throughout the entire play. I mean, the, the whole uh, analog of art, uh, magic as art, and the theatrical art uh, are, are right. constantly being invoked and spun together. I mean, the, the, the I, I don't want to actually move away from our no, sort no, no. Of no, more sure. no. overarching discussion of the, the the way that this play encapsulates all of his uh, theatrical works. But I, I did want to point out that the play begins with a giant theatrical spectacle, the, the Tempest itself, the, the mm. um, titular Tempest, uh, and it. it rocks the audience's mind. It would have been uh, a, a sort of lavish indulgence of all of the special effects that they would have had that at had that at time. time. Mm. Mm. And yet in the very next scene, Prospero walks on and says, it was all fake, guys. Yep, that right. was, none of that was real. What, what it was all my magic. <laughs> Me, I did it. 
And then he spends the next three hours of the play, or two hours of the play, it's actually quite a, uh, one of Shakespeare's shorter works. Uh, he then goes about being a director and telling people what to say. And mm. he, he fulfills that role that Shakespeare would have done as the principal dramatist, producer, uh, mm. director-ish. They didn't really have that term at the time, but that, that notion of somebody putting a play together. So, so he wants mm. you, I think, so, so, so what you're saying is that it could be uh, a play where Shakespeare is really thinking about what it means to be a playwright. Yes, I mean, much as you're and indicating, magicians I think and it's playwrights. very dangerous yeah. to or presume as well, the illusion think, yes. of the stage, that yeah. sort of thing. Right, right. I mean, I don't think we can ever say well, Shakespeare thought this and Shakespeare wanted that, but, but I think the, the play itself, the, the gravity of that interpretation is so intense, it's... Yes, yeah, so I, I think, I mean, I'd love mm. to come back to this because it does also raise the question of what actually happens in the play because mm. in some sense nothing does. Well, very little does, except mm. Ferdinand and Miranda get engaged. Yeah. Well, this is actually yeah. what I want to call yeah, but, but, but before we do that, just, <laughs> oh, no. just, just, just to quickly, just quickly to finish on, on the question of timing and it coming mm. at the end of his career, we were talking about this before. Yes. Um, it's certainly very tempting in a kind of, and I think this was a way of thinking about the play that became popular, you know, in the early 19th, late 18th century, the romantic view of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. his fair, my farewell to the stage. Um, um, but he was only 47, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. so, so one doesn't imagine somebody at that age, although, you know, granted life expectancy was 30, on mm. average at that time. But once you made it past, you know, your first 15 or 20 years, you had a fair bet of making it to, you know, my age. <laughs> um, so why would he at 47 have been writing a farewell to the stage? That's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm wondering. Mm. 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 I, I tend toward the interpretation that as the, the producer of his theatrical troupe, he would have had plans in motion for his retirement. He would have had right. an idea of when he was going to conclude. Because so he was a shareholder in the company and yeah, as much and as he was a writer. He now, couldn't just yeah. one day go, I'm out, guys, like, mm. and just mm. leave everybody. Mm. Uh, so I, I... Need to spend more time with the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I... Really want to build that boat. <laughs> so I tend towards that interpretation that, uh, you know, the final couple of plays that were written in collaboration with... Fletcher, it was yeah, Fletcher. Yeah. Um, that's right. Fletcher. Were th that passing of the torch, and so though that final cluster of plays, the Cymbeline, Henry the Eighth. Uh, um, oh, oh, sorry, I meant. Oh, the, you meant the before the Tempest, written yeah, ones, yeah. Uh, that, that he was aware in that period that he was coming to the end of right. his. And I, I think it also makes sense because uh, Shakespeare's career moved through these genres. You have the history plays and the comedies early on, and then. This, those sort of weird problem plays in the middle and the great tragedies and mm. you get to the end of his career and he has the, these wonderful romance mm. plays, mm. which is what they've been termed um, controversially. Mm. Yeah. And they really do seem to be him putting together these greatest hits packages, uh, even like drawing from multiple different stories and genres. Including his own previous plays. Exactly. I mean, I mean practically quotes from Macbeth uh, yeah. in, in here. In and I do it? tend to think of The Tempest and The Winter's Tale, two exquisite plays, uh, as complementary in that sense that they're folding all of his previous material with an audacity that I adore. He's basically saying, look at what I can do. Yes. In, the yes. Winter's, in The Winter's Tale, he goes expansive, so it's, uh, you know, decades of time pass. It's got this horrifying, tragic uh, first half and this playful, uh, unbelievably sort of silly, uh, but wonderful uh, second half. Mm. And, and it just goes in all directions, whereas this one focuses in, as you said, that, that unity of time and place. And, yeah. and, and yeah. it becomes very, very intimate. Also, again, utterly audacious, that second scene is shameless expo exposition. It's just no one else could get away with right. having characters literally just vomit backstory at each other for 15, <laughs> 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but Shakespeare yeah. does. But yet so it, has a lot, it has urgency in it because mm. he keeps breaking, or sorry, he, Prospero, keeps interrupting himself yes. mm. as he's giving the exposition mm. so that like um, Miranda, we're kind of hanging on like what, 
well, what is the point? What are you going to say? Yeah. So somehow he's, yes, giving tons of exposition, but yet he's doing it so artfully, yeah. or Shakespeare's doing it so artfully through Prospero. But, he, but he's also you... doing it, I'm sorry, Laurel, no, he's no. also doing it in a very human way because he gets irritable when he thinks she's not listening. Mm. Yes. There's several points where he stops and says, you listening? But you he might, that? yes, <laughs> and Shakespeare might have that in mind for the audience as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. pay attention, lots yeah. is being covered here. Yeah, I mean, we're jumping about a bit, but that would be a, a, a dramatic trick mm. um, that he would have needed in the context of how you put plays on in The Globe and The Rose and so on in those days, because large audiences talking to each other, you know, dropping walnuts on the floor, coming yeah. and going, You'd need points where you make a big noise and say, "Hey, are you listening to this?" Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this, this is he does this in a in a lot of his work. There's, there's a tail point that happens. Your tail deafness. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, that was uh, so. But you, you was you, you wanted to to, to talk about uh, Prospero and and uh, what he stands for. Was that what the, the oh, oh, I, I mean, interrupted I you? Yeah. Fly all over the place with this play. Um, um, aerial or all, all over. Uh, I would actually um, sort of pick up on uh, what Laurel was saying about that, you know, keeping our attention and, and uh, bringing us back to focus. He's doing it like a teacher. It's, an, it's not just, hey, pay attention. It's, I'm trying to teach you something. This is important. You're mm. about to head back out into the world. Miranda has been sequestered on this island away from humanity. And this is the last moment that he has some might say far too late uh, a, a moment to choose, but this is the last moment he has before she's heading back into a, a world that he himself knows is very dangerous, that's, that's filled with treacherous and mm. um, contemptuous people. And he's trying to alert her to that potential horror that, that mm. awaits her. Um, so he, he needs to teach her a, a sense of um, not, not Fear. He's not trying to make her fearful, but but uh, be uh, wary, be, yeah. be aware of what the world is like. Yeah, the, yeah. the people closest to you. My brother betrayed me. Yeah. You, know, you you can't just trust that this is a world of people with good intentions. Because she be says, safe. "Brave new world that has such people." In Indeed. It. I mean, and Miranda yeah. is literally, as the as her name implies, full of wonder mm. yes. at what she's finding, and she's fifteen, right? Yeah. So, so that's very endearing. But his, yes. it's partly a play about a father and a daughter. In fact, it's mm. very large. Indeed, yeah. yeah. But I also think of, um, the, you know, Prospero is, is telling the backstory to Miranda, like how they came to that island. Meanwhile, Shakespeare is telling his audience mm. a backstory to say why, you know, why we're at this point in the action. But also, uh, at that moment, Shakespeare as a writer has a captive audience for roughly three hours, yeah. and they, he has brought them out of the world into a little world mm -hmm. of the theater, and what, what will he give them in that time? And yeah. in part, he's, it's a tale about what the world is like, I think, and um, your choice that you have in how you respond to the world. Yes, yes. And it's almost like he's setting up um, setting up a story that, might, that could go in the direction of Hamlet, just like The Winter's Tale oh, sets up yes. a story that could go in the direction of Othello and where Hamlet could be tragic. chooses revenge. Could, could be tragic. It could be tragic. In fact, we have the threat of tragedy, Absolutely. I think, all through this play. Antonio and, and Sebastian have got the swords oh, ready to... Oh, exactly. But even before that, the, the, um, the storm. Mm. They could all die. In yeah. fact, we think perhaps they, they all have. have. Yeah. They've all died. They, you know, Miranda sees them drowning. Mm. Mm. Um, and so it's that we've got the threat of death, mm. if not the appearance mm. that death mm. has occurred. Um, got the story of treachery mm. and, in, and then current treachery on the mm. island mm. where it mm. keeps mm. going. The world has been brought to this island. Yeah. And so what will Prospero choose? What will we choose? You know, will we choose revenge like Hamlet? You know, in a winter's tale, will uh, choose um, that rampant jealousy of Othello that leads to mm. death? Or, and then mm. we have this moment where perhaps a different way can be chosen. And yeah. I think that's the big movement here. Yeah, that's okay. the big okay. yeah. action. You're right. We don't have a war. No. Like, this isn't the history plays. But what we do have, I think, in The Tempest is a portrait of a mind thinking mm -hmm. and perhaps a heart changing mm -hmm. in Prospero. And I think that's extraordinary, you know, to have us captive that is, to that. That is interesting. So, so you're saying that, I mean, one always wants to ask, reading a Shakespeare play, 
especially for the first time, or if you haven't read many Shakespeare plays, you want to say, so what's it about, yeah. right? What's the theme? What's... And so you're saying something like, it's about Prospero, and it's about uh, redemption or something like that, or, or yes. Or... But how does he get there? I guess, yeah, and, and that's how, the real yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because he could choose, well, I will do to you what you've done to me. Yeah. You know, your revenge. Revenge. You know, yeah. I've brought you here to this island. The whole cast of um, Milan and Naples. Right. Right. Those that have done him wrong right. in the past twelve years ago. Yeah. I think exactly as you're saying, that can't be understated. That exposition at the beginning is setting the audience's expectation. This is a revenge play, mm -hmm. and we have a super powerful magician who has every reason to want to enact like powerful, painful vengeance upon these people. And that whets our appetite in the audience. This is, I think I've said this before, so I apologize for how cheap this is, but it, <laughs> it's like a, a metaphysical saw film is the expectation. You're suddenly, oh, how's he gonna mess them up? How's he going mm. to po right. potentially kill them? Like this, right. is, this is, he's going to enact uh, an, an ultimate punishment upon them. But Shakespeare knows that that expectation from the audience isn't particularly helpful. It could be superficially uh, tasty, uh, you know, for the, mm. for the span of the play. But he, I, I suspect he wants us to take a more uh, powerful um, message and experience out of the theatre. So it becomes mm. exactly as you're saying about uh, alchemizing that rage into forgiveness. Oh, that's a great phrase, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I think it is. We, we, we follow that expectation of how's he going to get them, and that final shift that you were talking about is him actually accepting through Ariel's perspective upon events, which I think we need to discuss, but through that experience, he suddenly realizes that he is imprisoned in a way uh, just like everybody else is imprisoned in their various ways on the island. And the only way that he can free himself from that imprisonment is to let go of his revenge. I do mm. forgive thee, exactly. he says at the end, doesn't yeah. he? Um, so this is, a very, this is a very useful line of thinking um, when you're asking yourself, what's this actually all about? Partly because, you know, there have been some people who've said that there isn't actually a lot of character development in this in this play. Those people are wrong, but yes. Yeah, well, it, but yeah. Uh, this is this is a line that people have taken. If you think about the richness of character in young Macbeth or Othello or something, is Miranda any more than just a kind of marvelling fifteen-year-old who goes, "Wow, Dad, did you do that?" You know? <laughs> um, is Ferdinand any more than a kind of conventional romance prince? who goes, oh, Miranda, you know, whatever you bid me do, I will do, you know, my service is all I need, you know. Um, and Antonio and Sebastian are just pantomime villains who are sneaking up behind the, behind the hero. I mean, this is, a, this, is a, this is a line of thought that also says, um, not only are the characters not very interesting, but nothing actually happens. I mean, in the sense that Prospero can just make anything happen, so you kind of go, well, it doesn't matter, because as yeah. soon as you've realised that that first scene was a complete illusion, then it's almost like you jump to the end where he says, our revels now are ended and these are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you go, well, okay, so it's that, just magic. Well, yeah. but the, it's interesting that you say that because, yes, there's that element throughout The Tempest about magic and the, it's the seeming ease with mm. which he makes things appear or noises Absolutely. sound or yes. banquets appear. Or, do it. Or, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. But the difficulty, I think, the, the thing that seems beyond magic is the changing of the will yeah. and yeah. his own will. Yeah. And that's um, a march, that seems to be the true miracle. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. Where mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. headed in one direction mm -hmm. and yet to be able to change yeah. direction and then create an entirely different future, not only for himself, but for mm -hmm. his daughter mm -hmm. and the future of those, you know, of Naples and Milan as well, oh, those places. Um, because it returns to the real politic world very much. In yeah, the world, and that's it? why I think The Tempest is actually the perfect play hmm. for right now. Um, oh, you okay. Know. <laughs> okay. oh, well, this will be interesting. <laughs> Just going to put it out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you think about it? I mean, as, as we're in this time of pandemic, I was going to say, because they're isolated. Or? Well, no, I mean, like, well, the <laughs> island's looking pretty good to yeah. me. Yeah. Right? Human wet <laughs> wipes, and I think. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but and Gonzalo picks up on this as well. Oh, like, yeah. this could be yes. a utopia. Yes, he does do that. Um, yes, he does, yeah. And, you know, the mention of, there's the mention of paradise. 
but at the end, Prospero returns to the world, but he does so very intentionally. Mm -hmm. He does so mindfully. Every third thought will be of his death. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so drown my book. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. So I won't just be living in art or artifice. I'll burn my book, I'm sorry. Burn, I'll uh, mm -hmm. be a part mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. but it's going to look very different than it did before. Yeah. And part of me thinks that it looks very different because mm -hmm. he's had the, um, the threat of death, mm -hmm. exile, um, where he's actually suffered mm. for a long time um, mm. on that island. Mm. I don't know. And so he's got a more, he's returning to the world very um, sober mindedly. Right. Um, that's how I think of so, it. So the lockdown has kind of focused, <laughs> focused him on the things that he was doing wrong and the need to and what be really more matters. forgiving and what really matters in your life. Yeah. I don't okay. know. That's just mm -hmm. how I've been thinking no, about like it in the that. last couple that's, of days. That's a 2020 way of reading. Yeah, <laughs> that's <absolutely. right>. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I do agree. I mean, in, in that line of thought, I do uh, agree that it is about a more subtle conception of, of character. And, and one, Prospero is, by virtue of being so powerful and so dominant in the play, you can sometimes miss how enormous the, the shift in his perspective is to, to even have that questioning of himself mm. and to mm. change the momentum of you know, what he's going to inflict upon people, how he's going to live the remainder of his life, how his relationship with his daughter is going to change. You know, they've, they've mm. gone from this lockdown circumstance where he was homeschooling her, literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully a little easier than we all found it. Um, and uh, he's returning back into a world where, where their relationship will be necessarily transformed. He will go on to, again, return to a society that she's not even familiar with. Um, yeah. And that he has seen both the best and worst of. Yes. Although, yeah. is she not familiar with it? Because in the play, like for the three hours, she's seen quite an array of of little portraits of how the world works, I mm. guess. Um, well, and the Caliban experience when she was... Oh, even, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Being on the island, just yeah. living on the island actually hasn't removed her from human nature or from the way... Or Caliban small nature, societies if that's human. Are, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then we see um, that, that set piece yeah. where the curtains part and there is Ferdinand and Miranda playing chess, which is kind of like a little... A little symbol that she knows how to play oh, yeah. the political game. Sure. I think so. That's. Sure. But yes, you're right. Maybe it is book knowledge, but. No, no. I, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's clear that. Uh, I mean, they say repeatedly that he, Prospero, has been her tutor. Mm. He has. Uh, he has taught her to be equal to a man uh, in, in a society in which that's quite a controversial thought. When this was written, that's very unusual. But she, she speaks to. Uh, Ferdinand as an equal, she might be naive in her vision of you know the the rabble of scum that she meets at the end, who are all drunkards and you know potential murderers and schemers and villains. And yet, and, oh brave new world! And says, oh brave new world. So she's naive in that way, but but uh, in her personal dealings with people, she's very forthright and thoughtful and um, yes, considered yes, yes. Um, uh, just thinking about what you were saying about the people she meets, of course there are wonderful opportunities for slapstick comedy from Trinculo and Caliban and yeah. Stefano, the four-legged beast. It's just absolutely <laughs> wonderful on the stage. Um, um, if if um, any of our listeners haven't seen a production of The Tempest, that nearly always steals the show yes. with the, the four feet That's sticking right. out at one end of the blanket <laughs> and, and, um, and Stefano saying, this is a peculiar looking four-legged beast. <laughs> Whereas, you know, is this, is this native to the island or whatever? So it's, it's, the, the comedy is very, is very good. Mm -hmm. And isn't it fascinating? We have the huge storm, which, you, you know, a director can just go to town making this storm happen. It can be, you know, with meager means of fabric and just noise and lights. Or you could just have, a, you know, you could have the enormous ship sinking mm -hmm. on stage yeah. and then to have that and then followed by four feet sticking out of a blanket, <laughs> <laughs> like that diverse array of And, and, the, of and the, drunken, the drunken talk mm. from Caliban and, and Stefano and Trinculo mm. as well. Yeah. It does immediately turn quite dark, because you're yes. right. It's, yes. it's well, they, they are themselves planning to murder Prospero, and Caliban's way of describing that, and knock a, what does he say, knock a nail, into, him. The, knock yeah. a nail into his head. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, uh, he's auctioning off Miranda as well. He's saying she will... She'll breed you. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's it's 
it gets incredibly dark very quickly, which I think is kind of the point that they go from these very farcical, silly, whimsical, drunken characters to giving over to all of those worst impulses of colonialism so, and so, exploitation. Uh, yeah, okay, which we can we should talk about if we have time. But one thing that interests me, we we've, we've touched on it earlier, is um, is how much Prospero's sheer power and the power of magic kind of takes the dramatic tension out of the play. Yes. Um, uh, and the comparison in my mind is with um, Measure for Measure, where when the Duke appears halfway through having given away his kingdom to this terrible Angelo who's done awful things to Isabella, and suddenly the Duke appears and changes everything. Yeah. And, and there is no longer any doubt about what's going to happen. He just rearranges the world like a god. Mm. And Prospero does that. I mean, we don't really have any doubt, do we, after that second scene where Miranda says, oh, this is so terrible, save them, save them. And Prospero says, it's all right, dear, it's all, it's all under control. And from, and from then on, even the plots of the three comic characters or Antonio trying to plot, you're thinking, but they haven't got a chance. He completely controls all of this. Yeah. So is that a problem for contemporary audiences, the magic side of it? Or, or, or if, you've, if you've grown up with J.K. Rowling and, uh, and uh, um, Gandalf, maybe you're not so bothered about this. What, what, do, you, what, what I, do you think? I get the sense that this actually ties into that question of character in the play. Mm. Uh, because, again, from, from that gigantic spectacle of the Tempest to the immediate undercutting of, don't worry, it wasn't real, no one's going to get hurt. And as you said, laying out that for the remainder of the play, none of the characters, at least none of the characters that are intimate with Prospero are in any danger. Right. So may maybe his enemies might Mm. have something happen to them by virtue of the um, revenge. But uh, for everybody else, they're, they're safe. So that dramatic tension gets taken away. And in effect, I do think that the, the plot is somewhat uh, rendered not irrelevant, but immaterial. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's Shakespeare... It's a bit vestigial. Really. Yes, yeah, yeah. because I think that that's the point, is Shakespeare is saying, that's not that's what not I want point. you to pay attention to. Mm. Look at the way these characters are interacting yeah. and look at the way in which they're rolling around these very complex ideas and they all have very disparate viewpoints. So yeah, yeah. say for example the, the landing on the island where Alonso and Gonzalo and uh, uh, Antonio and Sebastian, everybody is just basically getting their bearings. Well we lived through that, now where are we? <laughs> they all have very distinct disparate uh, visions of what should happen on this island. Do they yeah. take it and exploit it? Do they just wallow in their pity? Uh, Gonzalo imagines this beautiful new uh, vision of uh, a life of man heading forward. It, it's, again, that's, that's a, a pointless plot that has nothing to do with anything really, except that it's weighing up how different people uh, regard a new philosophical problem in lived experience and that it, it's about how individuals all have their own viewpoints and that multiplicity of interpretation is what Shakespeare wants to Yeah, that, I think that's really interesting. And in a way, it goes back to something Laurel was saying early on, which is the experimental nature of the, right, of the play. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you struggle a little bit to stick it into the usual genres of comedy and tragedy or whatever, or, or, or indeed romance, I suppose. Um, but also you struggle to to use the usual categories by which you might analyse a Shakespeare play, which would be plot, character, theme, etc., etc. Mm. This resists those conventional kind of ways of thinking. The plot is a bit vestigial. The characters, as I was suggesting, except for Prospero, tend to be a little bit, um, not, they're not flat, but mm. slightly c conventional. But yes, what's with, brilliant... With the capacity to, to surprise To, to surprise you. So like what, Caliban's use of language, etc. Sure. Yeah. But then, what's brilliant is this: is the is the is the way that he's thinking on a almost a completely new level beyond all those categories, as if yeah. he's inventing a new way of doing drama yeah. almost. Um, and also, which I is think why it's I tend to say that he had plans for more. He wasn't, right. he wasn't going to stop. You know? yeah. It's and it's like we can't expect necessarily that each of those characters will, characters will be developed. There's a yeah a number of them in a short amount of time, but it is those relationships, isn't it? And how um, groups of characters are mirror one another in yes. their relationships, yes, sure. and that mm -hmm. I think is quite revealing. The plotters, the different, different plots that kind of reflect one another. 
Mm -hmm. um, that's very revealing. And also um, the role of Ariel and Caliban mm. to reflect. Which we haven't talked about. Yeah. Mm. To reflect the people on stage back mm. to themselves, mm. as mm. well as reflect back to the audience what mm. is human nature. Mm. Um, mm. You know, Ariel has these lovely lines about, you know, like observing Ferdinand and how he had his arms in that sad little knot. Yes, like, she's right. not either familiar with sadness or with um, the way yeah. people express sadness. Yeah. But then also, um, Caliban, you know, you gave me language and then yes. turned them into curses, that yes. kind of thing. But that's a very human thing to yes. say yes. and do. Yes. Um, yes. So it's that's almost right. like, are, are we as an audience, when we see The Tempest or read The Tempest, if we're if we're um, thinking that the characters are a bit thin, is the real character development yeah. ourselves? Oh, yes. I don't uh, know. Like as in human nature yeah, and human yeah. development. Like Look, you've been given this time, you've been given this is island. Very what interesting. are you going to do with it? That is very interesting. I'm. I know we have to wind up in a minute, but I'm just thinking. I'm pretty sure it was Ian McKellen who said this. You know, the actor who's done both Prospero and Gandalf, which is an interesting yeah. pair. And he says something like, you know, you're aware on stage as Prospero, uh, as, as a character in this play, that more than almost any other play, it's up to the audience what they make of it. Mm -hmm. There's only a certain amount that the actors can actually do. You can't direct the audience. No. It's what the audience takes yeah. from the play that's the, that's the really interesting thing. So, well, I, I yeah, did yeah. just, just I think really I'm right about who it was, yeah. artlessly want to uh, like uh, uh, grab onto your coattails there. Just, just briefly, because we've got to wind up. Well, I yeah. Just the, you'd mentioned earlier. There's that image of Miranda and Ferdinand playing chess, mm -hmm. and I do think that the play that that kind of unlocks the whole play is it's about the way in which two characters who look very similar yeah. react yeah. Uh, in different ways and combat with one another, or. or mm -hmm. uh, Compete is probably a better term. Uh, their ideas compete against one another. So Prospero and Antonio, or Prospero and Sycorax, or right. uh, Caliban and uh, Ariel, etc. Uh, and I, I think it's that negotiation of ideas, that that playing around with the ideas that he wants to actually explore in his work, and that the the play itself invites the audience to participate in. So yeah. as you said, there's no answer to any of these things that the play just generates all of these questions that's that right. then it leaves and the at the end he says by your indulgence set me, set me free Absolutely. he's talking directly to the audience mm. well it seems our revels now are ended <laughs> um, so we better we better bring this to a close but uh, can I just say uh, thank you Laurel and thank you Colin fascinating play we could be sitting here all day talking about this um, but thank you very much indeed yeah.